Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute's panel on examining the role of economic analysis in antitrust. I'm Mark Jamison. I'm a non-resident senior fellow with the AEI, and I'm also director of two research centers at the University of Florida. As we think about antitrust, it's it's kind of surprising that it's it's in the headlines, and a lot of people are talking about it. it used to be that antitrust was just kind of a small group of attorneys and economists, and very rarely did the work that they did make headlines. But now with the rise of big tech and the push in with some people within the current administration on trying to change antitrust, take it back to where it had been a few decades ago. Now, a lot of the, the things that have been done are being challenged, including of the role that economics plays, because people are arguing that antitrust has been far too weak, in many senses as maybe even a failure, and pointing the finger at these economists and their, their emphasis on, well, you know, we really need good economic analysis, antitrust, and, and we need to worry about how it affects the economy. And in fact, we need to focus on how it affects consumers. And people argue that's just gone too far. And so now we have really large companies, and that's very inconsistent with antitrust. So we have with us a really distinguished panel of people who have been involved in antitrust work as economists over a few decades from both sides of the aisle. And I'm honored to have them with us today to talk about this important issue. So let me introduce them and then we'll jump right into it. We have with us Babette Bullock. She's a professor at Pepperdine University School of Law where she teaches and conducts research on antitrust, telecommunications, privacy and sports law. Babette served as Chief Economist at the Federal Communications Commission from 2018 to 2019, and was previously a research fellow at George Mason University, University of Southern California, and here at AEI. She earned her BA from California State University, Chico, and her JD from Columbia University Law School, and her PhD from UC Davis. Bruce Kabayashi is the Page and Henry Butler Chair of Law and Economics at George Mason University. He served, he previously served as a senior economist at the Federal Trade Commission, as a senior research associate for the U.S. Sentencing Commission, and as an economist at the Department of Justice. He recently served as director of the FTC's Bureau of Economics, and he earned his BA, MA, and PhDs from the University of California, Los Angeles. Diana Moss has served as president of the American Antitrust Institute since January 2015. Her work spans both antitrust and regulation with industry expertise in digital technology, electricity, petroleum, food and agriculture, airlines, telecommunications, and healthcare. Before joining the Institute, Diane was at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission where she coordinated the agency's competition analyses for electricity mergers. She's also an adjunct faculty at the Department of Economics of, UC, of uh, the University of Colorado, Colorado Boulder, and she ho owns, holds an MA from the University of Denver and a PhD from the Colorado School of Mines. Howard Shalansky is a law professor at Georgetown University Law Center, where he is teaching and where his teaching and research focus on antitrust law and regulation. He previously served as administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, and directed the Bureau of Economics at the Federal Trade Commission from 2012 to 2013, where he previously had been deputy director. Earlier in his career, he was chief economist at the FCC, a senior economist for the President's Council of Economic Advisors at the White House, and clerked at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, the D.C. District Court in Philadelphia, and for Justice Scalia at the U.S. Supreme Court. Howard earned his BA from Haverfield, excuse me, Haverford College, and received his JD and PhD from UC Berkeley. David Sibley is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where he teaches graduate and undergraduate courses on industrial organization, antitrust law, and economics. He advised the FCC in 2018-2019 on the Sprint T-Mobile merger, served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economic Analysis at the Department of Justice from 2003-2004 and worked at Bell Labs. He also consulted for and advised the Chairman of the Civil Aeronautics Board in the 1980s, 
at, after serving as a senior economist in the White House Council of Economic Advisors. David holds an undergraduate degree in economics from Stanford and a PhD from Yale. Scott Walston, he's president and senior fellow at the Technology Policy Institute. An economist by training, Scott has deep expertise in industrial organization, public policy, and his research focuses on competition, regulation, telecommunications, the economics of digitization, and technology policy. He was previously the economics director at the FCC's National Broadband Plan, an economist at the World Bank, and the White House's Council of Economic Advisors, and a resident fellow here at AEI. Scott received his undergraduate degree from Washington University in St. Louis and his PhD in economics from Stanford University. For everyone's reference, Scott also joined our Monday event on how Congress could act more constructively on antitrust. So panelists and audience, welcome. We're glad that you're here. So Scott, let me start out with, with you. You were part of our panel on Monday about what Congress could and should do on antitrust. Um, it'd be nice to tie this panel and that panel together. So could you do that for us, please? How does what Congress does and what economists do in antitrust, how do they relate? All right, thanks, Mark. Um, thanks for having me back here again. And um, because I was on that panel, I'll try to stay mostly out of this discussion, but I will try to put them, uh, put them together. So uh, the panel earlier this week focused mostly on legislation and the questions of why Congress has gotten involved in antitrust, what it could do, should do and seems likely to do. I don't want to pretend that the panel agreed on all of these. Um, and in fact, they didn't, which is what, one of the things that made it a good panel. Um, and what I say next aren't necessarily my views, of course. But to bring us up to date on the discussion so far and the answers the earlier panel gave, uh, the question of why, uh, sort of the, there's a general agreement by the populist left and right that whoever controls the pipes controls the message, was a phrase someone used, and that too much power is in the hands of too few. Uh, and although the Democrats and Republicans have different concerns with Democrats more concerned about misinformation and Republicans more concerned with their belief that big tech discriminates against their views, um, although some argue that that's overly uh, simplistic, uh, with what it could or should do, that Congress could um, help change the priorities, change the weights and default presumptions that the antitrust agencies use on what is pro or anti-competitive, uh, the, the presumptions that they start with, raise the bar for mergers to be approved, um, and increase resources available to the agencies, uh, which all might differ from what it will do, uh, what Congress will do. And the only thing that everyone thought was likely to happen was to increase the resources available for enforcement. The one question I might tee up for this group here is that everyone on that panel agreed that more resources would be good, everyone including me. Uh, but we actually never discussed whether there was evidence that they were under-resourced. Um, and I'm one of the people who said that without without evidence um, that more resources would be good. Uh, so I you know I wonder what is the if there is in fact evidence that that would be useful. Uh, some of the key issues that emerged um, is that many of the policymakers' concerns are on issues unrelated to or at best tangentially related to antitrust, like privacy and data, and those are probably not best addressed through antitrust legislation. Uh, Congress might be conflating antitrust and regulation with some of the proposed legislation that makes the FT, uh, that seems to make the FTC more of a regulator than an antitrust enforcer. And there's a clear big is bad mentality on both sides um, as evidenced, for example, by uh, the proposed legislation, which targets firms almost exclusively based on their size. Um, and of course the, the economics does not uh, support that, uh, that particular view of antitrust. Um, and also that the legislation is targeting for specific firms, which also isn't really part of antitrust theory. And the question becomes then whether uh, if there's if there are actual antitrust issues, should Congress um, be backing up to take a broader view of what new legislation will look like and, and what economics says as to whether antitrust is um, sort of appropriately dealing with competition in the economy. And I think that takes us into the issues that economists should think about and um, into this panel. All right, well, thank you, Scott, for laying that for us, laying that out for us. So Bruce, let's now lay some groundwork before we jump into some of the things that Scott raised and, and some other issues as well. Yeah, describe for us, if you could, please, what's the purpose of antitrust and how has economics lent to the development of that purpose? Well, um, I guess I want to talk about uh, 
two major things. One is just briefly talk about consumer welfare and the consumer welfare standard. And I think Diana will follow up with, with some other thoughts on that. Uh, and then talk about what my view is of what antitrust ec economic economists do, uh, not only at the agencies, but outside the agencies. So, so the first one is uh, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, controversy about the, the consumer welfare standard or looking at uh, economic welfare. And, and it's easy for an economist because uh, welfare is basically a measure of the benefits generated by exchange and production in a market. And so if you maximize wealth, total welfare, you're maximizing the benefits that you get from, from markets. Uh, the hook to competition is that we have textbook models of perfect competition, uh, which generate an equilibrium outcome in which maximizes the, the total available benefits available in a market. And so um, it's sort of this nice invisible hand uh, um, uh, result uh, and uh, competition is good and competition results in a maximization of, of total welfare. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that these text models of perfect competition, there's really no competition in them and they only generally exists in, in the, on the pages of these textbooks or in the blackboard. Uh, and so uh, they don't exist in the real world and imposing such an outcome uh, through antitrust or regulations, really not a sensible goal. And that's not what antitrust has been doing the last 40 years. Antitrust law rather seeks to deter transactions and conduct that would harm competition. Uh, such an approach would be sensible if uh, an improved welfare on the margin as long as preventing the harm to competition that's targeted results in greater output increased welfare, and two, enforcement of the antitrust laws somehow reliably identifies transactions and contact that harms this type of competition. Uh, so um, both of those are, of course, uh, subject to, to question. Uh, what antitrust economists at, at the US federal agencies do, in, in my experience, are, is that they use economic models and data to help identify transactions and conduct that would harm competition in the competitive process. Uh, they use models and data to test and refine the tools that they use uh, to make predictions about the effects of the transaction and to improve the accuracy of these predictions. Um, it is not the case that, that I think uh, many people have this view that economists are one-sided case killers. I mean, true about me, but it's not true about generally uh, the, the people who work for me at the FTC or, or the people I work with at the DAJ. What economists do really is try and separate between transactions that are anti-competitive and pro-competitive and move antitrust policy toward uh, and, and enforcement toward expanding challenges to anti-competitive transactions and conduct while simultaneously contracting challenges to pro-competitive uh, um, transactions and conduct. I mean, there's a lot of controversy about how you do this, um, but uh, I mean, I think uh, to the last person at the Bureau of Economics, that's what everybody thought their job was. Uh, you know, I, often economists serve to, to expand enforcement. I think a great example of this uh, is illustrated by the evolution of the antitrust analysis of hospital mergers at the uh, FTC and, and other agencies. Uh, during the 1990s, the FTC, DOJ, and the state of California lost eight consecutive hospital merger challenges. Uh, after, soon after he got in office uh, in 2002, FTC chairman Tim Mira set up a task force aimed at analyzing the reasons why this happened. Uh, and at the heart of this analysis were merger retrospectives conducted by the Bureau of Economics of the hospital mergers that were challenged by the agencies but allowed by the courts. These retrospectives used credible causal research designs to show that these consummated hospital mergers, consistent with the prediction of the agency, generated double digits price increases relative to control house markets. Um, the analysis in particular exposed the flaws of using Elzinga Hogarty and critical loss tests to define geographic markets, uh, tests that were drawing broad geographic markets that often included hospitals hundreds of miles away from emerging parties. Armed with these studies and these results, the FTC was successfully able to uh, challenge a consummated hospital merger in Evanston, Illinois, and subsequently embarked on an even more impressive decade-long streak of successful hospital cha merger challenges. 
uh, streak only recently um, ended uh, by the FTC's loss in Philadelphia and Einstein Jefferson. Um, um, the, these they are, it also resulted in improvements. The, the uh, economists changed the way in which uh, the agencies examined uh, competition. Instead of looking at consumers and consumer choice, they realized that often prices and terms were set by negotiations with hospital, uh, uh, hospitals and insurance companies. And they came up with willingness to pay models and bargaining models to, to actually look at competition and how mergers change the, the incentives uh, to, to bargain. Um, this is one, but one of examples of the influence of economics and economists on antitrust enforcement. Uh, and it illustrates the evidence-based approach to antitrust policy where causal and credible research designs are used to generate evidence to support and inform both the current antitrust enforcement decisions as well as decisions to revise antitrust enforcement. Uh, John Yoon, uh, Luke Frobe, and I are, are writing a paper on uh, enforcement innovation for the ALJ's up forthcoming uh, antitrust symposium. And we, we have a whole list, not quite a top 10 list, but uh, we, we've been thinking about this. Uh, and I, I guess during that process, we started that a, a while ago. And, and at the end of the last draft that I did, I, I felt like I was uh, in some sense writing a eulogy or something. <laughs> Uh, because it's clear that the current administration does not plan to uh, continue this approach uh, to the extent they can. I, I think this issue will be discussed at length in the panel, and so I'll, I'll stop here and, and uh, yield right. to Diane. Well, thank, thank you, Bruce. I appreciate that. As I kind of understand what you're telling us is that the things that economics has contributed is first to understand that you know, customers value things so much and if an antitrust action can expand what customers, how much customers value things, improvements in quality, et cetera, improvements in technology, that's great. And if it lowers prices, consumers benefit from that as well. So that's kind of one of the, some of the keys in the economic analyses. Um, you talked about testing our beliefs. We all have beliefs about what's true and what's not. And economics gives us some tools for testing and seeing whether that was right. And, and then you've said that we, you went back and or people went back and looked at some past decisions um, by the, uh, the federal, by, by antitrust regulators in the, in the U.S. and found that, well, maybe some of those decisions didn't work out so well, or at least some of the cases, some of the mergers that happened um, actually did end up harming customers. And so how can we actually uh, improve that going forward, so putting some rigor to it. So, all right, well, thank you very much for all of that. Um, Diana, how, what would you add to what Bruce has said or what do you disagree with? Well, thanks Mark and thanks to AEI for inviting me onto this panel today with this um, amazing group of experts. Um, I think there's a really good questions for where we are I, uh, right now in, in the course of antitrust enforcement in the United States, but I would say more broadly competition policy uh, of which antitrust enforcement is a part. There are other tools in the, uh, in the toolkit that we need to think hard about. Uh, but to answer your questions and respond to some of what Bruce has, um, has um, very artfully uh, summarized, I, you know, I think we all need to remind ourselves um, you know, that we live and breathe and exist in, in a market-based economy. Um, markets are really unique phenomenon and they're very important. Um, they are supported by democratic principles uh, uh, that are very true uh, to the U.S. political system. They are very much a political economy uh, phenomenon, um, but markets do not self-regulate, right? Markets do really well when there's competition on the supply and on the demand side. Um, but generally speaking, uh, when, when there is the accretion of market power and the exercise of market power, uh, we see the real need for referees in the market. It's just like any game, right? You need a referee to ensure a level playing field. And that's what antitrust enforcement is. And we are at a point in the US economy where we are seeing um, uh, decline, declining competition, rising concentration, uh, lots of uh, empirical evidence. This is an empirical case. We're all economists here. We like evidence uh, for growing uh, inequality gaps for uh, transfers of wealth um, from consumers to, uh, to producers, 
uh, just a, 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 in a, a, a really robust growing uh, body of evidence for declining competition. So we really are at an inflection point and that sort of highlights the importance of antitrust enforcement as referee. So what is the purpose? Well, my view is the purpose of the antitrust laws is to protect the competitive process. And you know that's how the sausage gets made in, in markets. Um, and, and Congress obviously had views about how important competition was when they elevated uh, antitrust enforcement to the level of law enforcement, right? It is law enforcement. It's all about de detecting violations and deterring violations um, with penalties or other types of remedies. So, so within the, the rubric of protecting the competitive process, um, obviously we wanna promote the welfare of, of trading partners. And generally that comes out in terms of who's on the receiving end of the exercise of market power? Who, who is harmed, adversely affected by the exercise of market power? Well, that could be the consumer, that could be the worker, that could be the small business. Um, so the consumer welfare standard, which is actually quite robust and flexible uh, and has a pretty deep reach, can identify violations anywhere in the supply chain, right? Not just the output market. We're concerned about input markets. We're concerned about uh, problems overall in the supply chain. We now have supply chains that are very fragile because of consolidation, that are very bottlenecked because of consolidation. And uh, the consumer welfare standard, which really has not been uh, applied to the full extent of its scope, um, really can reach to all of those, all of those issues uh, within a supply chain. And economics has played a very, very important role in, uh, I think, as Bruce mentioned, and I would second this, in identifying strategic behavior, modeling it, using economic techniques, and quantifying harms uh, to affected market participants. Um, we can talk a little bit later about how the consumer welfare standard has been interpreted too narrowly, and that's in part how we've gotten to where we are, are now. Economists have, always, have also played a really important role in developing agency guidance, for example, um, uh, the work that's been done on, on anti-competitive effects and the guidelines and efficiencies. Um, but we're, we're starting to see evidence of, of um, a little bit of, not a little bit, I would say a lot of friction and tension between how the economists think uh, and the role of economics uh, and how it marries up with legal uh, doctrinal issues. Uh, there are some problems translating difficult concepts to the courts. We have cases turning on very specific issues like market definition, which is often based on critical loss analysis. We have cases uh, turning on efficiencies claims, for example, AT&T, Time Warner. Um, so we are starting to see more friction uh, and tension between the role of economics, which should, should play a very important support role uh, and legal doctrine as we see higher levels of concentration and uh, growing concerns and a growing body of evidence. So economists have done what they're really good at doing. They've focused on price effects, lots of price data. Go back to Staples Office Depot, one of the first instances where there was this sort of use of a large database of, of, of prices and some really good analysis at the FTC on price effects. Um, and, and so economists have gone, you know, they've gone to uh, the, uh, the most obvious source of, of um, of uh, data and analysis and a way to deploy methodologies, uh, but they need to do more. And we're seeing that. Bruce mentioned uh, analysis of quality effects in hospital mergers, but outside the hospital um, arena, we don't see a lot of modeling of quality effects or modeling of innovation effects. And I think economists have a tremendous amount to offer there, especially in the digital business ecosystems where we have zero price markets and uh, we would be primarily concerned about uh, the quality of service as it translates into user privacy. Um, so to sum up, I think we need a rebalancing of the role of economics and legal doctrinal issues. Um, if you look at things like the loss of the structural presumption, uh, nobody can find it anymore. Uh, if we look at the rising standards for showing collusion in a lot of the private cases uh, where economists have played a really a significant role in, in uh, persuading courts that it's not collusion, it's all oligopoly competition, which is not a violation. 
Um, uh, economists can do more there and we need more of a rebalancing. And finally, I think it really behooves economists to think about uh, drawing in and collaborating with other important uh, viewpoints and disciplines. Uh, the business schools have a tremendous uh, amount of information and analysis to offer. Uh, um, the marketing specialists, strategic management folks. Um, I just finished a paper on the digital business ecosystems collaborating with uh, marketing experts at the University of North Florida. Uh, we could not have done that analysis or had the richness and the depth of conclusions if we had not collaborated with folks outside our own discipline. There we go. All right. My computer fought back. <clears throat> All right. So thank you very much, Diana. Appreciate, uh, appreciate what, you're, what you're explaining. And then the audience can see the kind of, of uh, situation we find ourselves in, in the debates over economics, that um, part of the analyses say that, well, you know, what customers are doing and what's going on in the economics of an industry drives what the industry looks like. But there's other schools of thought that think in terms of if there's a large business, that's by definition less competition. And, and so within that, uh, we have these, these kinds of debates and what is economics really supposed to be doing? And we have on our panel two people who have both PhDs in economics and law degrees. So maybe you guys have really internal conflicts and we'll, we'll find out as we go through our panel. So let's, let's now step back from that big picture look and analyze what is it that economists actually do? Although um, uh, Bruce and Diane have already talked about that. Um, let me turn to David, if I could. David, you've served as an economist and antitrust uh, authorities. What kinds of things do economists actually do in antitrust? Oh, you're right in saying that we are segueing from big picture into rather small picture. I'm glad you did that for me. Uh, so I'm going to describe, uh, in my experience at least, what economists actually do and what, what, what they end up not doing very much. Now, you could talk about this topic in a lot of ways. I'm going to do it by going over different types of conduct and describing what I think economists do in those areas. In some sense, the uh, I think the best developed role for economists is in horizontal mergers. Uh, we now have a coherent set of tools for evaluating horizontal mergers. There's a pretty steady flow of research that finds its way into these tools. Uh, and when uh, mergers are contested, at least in my experience, I, I worked on AT&T T-Mobile for DOJ. And then as somebody mentioned, I helped advise the FCC in the T-Mobile acquisition of Sprint. The issue of what models to use was, was really not an issue there. It was mainly an argument about inputs, uh, how to adapt those models in particular ways, but everybody was speaking the same language. And, you know, I think the agency economists uh, uh, have, have had a lot to do with this. Having merger simulation models that can be downloaded and anybody can use, uh, I think is a step forward. Uh, when we talk about economists' role in, uh, say, big tech, economists do think about big tech a lot in what they do, but I would have to say that it's sometimes a little bit narrow in focus. In the two wireless mergers that I've worked on, we thought a lot about technology, but at the end of the day, it's what does this do to marginal costs? So if there are any broader implications of technological changes, we didn't look at them, apart from the, pu the public interest showing that you have to make at the FCC. At, at the FCC. Uh, so in horizontal mergers, given the admitted limitations of, of what those tools do, they are accepted tools within their limits, they're well understood, and they have had the tires kicked a lot by a lot of smart people. So economists play a big role in horizontal mergers. Now the opposite is collusion. And here I'm gonna talk mostly from my experience at the DOJ. Uh, uh, I, I've obviously consulted in cases that involved collusion, but uh, at the DOJ, at least when I was there, economists played almost no role. The deputy for criminal enforcement, who at that time was Jim Griffin, would come to our Monday morning senior staff meetings and 
He would talk about interesting things like we're going to the Philippines to flip a witness on some price fixing case. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, whereas the rest of us were talking about diversion ratios and second requests. It was uh, the contrast was painful for those of us who had to be there and be boring when Jim was talking about this exciting stuff. But the point is that economists play very little role in that, apart from damages. Uh, the uh, uh, the DOJ does a brisk business in prosecuting price fixing, but it does that because of the corporate amnesty program, which I think was one of the smartest, simple things I've seen done in government. Uh, just get a steady flow of walk-ins. Those of you who think back far enough may remember that prior to the amnesty program, price fixing cases were usually uncovered by accident. You know, there was a big one in the 1960s involving toilet bowls of all things. And the only reason that came to light was the CEO of one of the manufacturers involved in the conspiracy was getting a divorce. In those days, there was no such thing as no-fault divorce, and his wife's detect hired detectives to go through her husband's desk, and they did. And guess what they found? Uh, so it's things like that. Uh, so collusion, every now and then in a collusion case, there'll be some argument about when the collusion effectively started, and that can certainly involve econometrics, no question. But for the most part, in the liability phase of collusion, that's that's not something that we got involved much at the DOJ. And from my view of private uh, uh, actions involving collusion, not much there either. Now, section two monopolization cases, uh, obviously economists do a lot there. Now, I wanna preface that by saying that my old boss at DOJ, Hugh Pate, uh, used to say, and according to him, his predecessors in his job said the same thing, that uh, one part of antitrust law that they didn't think accomplished much was monopolization law. Not that it, in principle, shouldn't accomplish much, but in practice, uh, monopolization cases tend to involve issues which are quite subtle, uh, which are hard to measure empirically, which may involve complicated issues of technology, and they go on forever. Uh, Actually, one of my, so something I did back at the DOJ along with Tom Barnett was work hard to shut down a couple of long running monopolization investigations with the staff deeply in love with the case and not, not wanting to stop. Uh, so yes, we're involved, but I wouldn't say in monopolization cases, it's real easy to do anything particularly useful. There are exceptions, US versus uh, Microsoft is one, where not only did the government win something, but the settlement appears to have accomplished more or less what the lawsuit was all about. So that's, that's a success. Now, in vertical mergers, which you're seeing talked about a lot, net, a lot nowadays because sometimes uh, they, they come up in big tech issues, uh, you know, economists don't do much there simply because antitrust agencies don't do a lot there. When I was in the job at DOJ, I asked the staff to come up with a short description of each vertical merger that the division had investigated seriously over the previous 10 years. It was a short list. It was on, I don't remember the exact number, but it was on the order of five or six or seven, something like that. Uh, and I don't think any of them were actually prosecuted. So to, to uh, uh, summarize, I'd say where economists are most active and most effective are, is probably horizontal mergers. Um, they could be more active and effective in vertical mergers probably, but so far they haven't been. Uh, and uh, so I think that's what I'll say. That, that's it for now. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, so I, I guess I'll have to tell my students that sometimes being an economist isn't quite as exciting as being a lawyer. Oh, great. We have Howard Schlensky here. He's both. And, and so he's looked at antitrust uh, from inside an agency He's looked at regulation from inside the FCC. He's looked at it from a White House perspective. All that as an economist, but he's also a law professor. So Howard, how do you sort out what it is that economists really do today in antitrust? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I think that David really covered it very nicely. And I think if you take a combination of David's remarks and Diana's remarks, you really get a good picture of what economists do, the areas in which they could be relevant, and frankly, what more they could do. So um, what I would say is probably the most important role that economists play, if I were to speak very candidly, um, would be to try to drill down and understand the extent to which uh, structural presumptions 
or efficiencies presumptions, depending on which kinds of activity we're talking about. Because I think in vertical mergers, there has long been something of an efficiency uh, production or, or presumption. But I think the job of economists has largely been, and I apologize for that background noise, it's not in my control. Um, uh, the, the role of economists, I think, has been to drill down and understand where those presumptions are or are not warranted. And so if you look at what FTC and DOJ economists do when they're reviewing a merger, they will look to see either whether a, a transaction that seems to be in an unconcentrated market will nonetheless have some effects. And I'll come back to that. And so that a presumption of no harm is unwarranted. But more commonly in a transaction where harm is likely based on the structure, or at least could be presumed, they're doing the narrower, more focused analysis to see what they can do to go beyond the presumption to demonstrate a likelihood of harmful effects. And on the defense side, I think you see economists doing exactly the opposite. And so I think the role of the economists is to either um, uh, add effects analysis that will justify and vindicate the structural presumptions or to push back against them. And if I had any area of disagreement with Diana, I largely completely agreed with her remarks, I don't think the structural presumption um, is hard to find. Um, I certainly think in a lot of cases that I've looked at, the structural presumption has been fairly easy to find. Um, but you know, if you look at cases like H&R Block and, and things like that, I think there really is a, a, a strong background presumption there. But I'll certainly, uh, I want to agree with Diana to the point that the level at which harm is presumed has floated upward. It's a point that John Quokka has made, the number of people have made when you look at actual enforcement levels. And I think that may largely be due to the work of economists. You know, frankly, both at the agencies where on occasion the economists will say, despite the concentration here, we don't think there's likely to be harm. Um, and on the defense side, you know, uh, teams of economists coming together and either winning cases in court or persuading the agency that their concerns can be resolved with a remedy or should, should, should be discarded altogether. So I think that's largely what I see as, as the job of the economists. Um, you know, e you know, sort of going beyond the presumptions is how I would put it. Um, I do think that there are, uh, I think there is important work for the economists to continue to do. Uh, I do think that buying power has been a neglected aspect of, uh, of a lot of antitrust enforcement. You know, David mentioned, um, you know, vertical mergers. And, and certainly if you look at the work that the DOJ's economists did in that case, work that I personally think was very good and that was a little bit cavalierly discarded by the district court, in, in my opinion. Um, that was work des designed to look at vertical mergers um, through a more rigorous economics lens, bringing in ideas like you know, bargaining power and how a vertical merger could affect bargaining power at different levels of the markets involved with that transaction. I think that economists can play a very useful role in bringing in modern theory to build up better ways to analyze what the actual effects of transactions are going to be. You know, vertical mergers, the reason we didn't see much enforcement in vertical mergers, there was some at the agencies, but, you know, not in the courts, to be sure, was because of this very strong presumption that, you know, the, the, the efficiencies of these mergers through reduction of double marginalization or through various kinds of, um, you know, uh, supply chain efficiencies and things like that uh, would ultimately in order to the benefit of consumers and really couldn't create the kinds of harms of horizontal mergers. I think we're starting to see some very interesting econo economic analysis suggesting that maybe we've missed something um, in, in some of these vertical mergers. That's a very useful role for economists, even if it hasn't yet gotten traction with the courts. Um, which just leads me to sort of a final comment I'll make. I think one of the really valuable things economists can do is to lay the tracks ahead of the doctrine. Um, you know, a lot of antitrust doctrine is stuck on economic ideas that got embedded in the case law, led to decisions that then made it very, very hard for people to bring cases. So we didn't get a lot of cases being brought in certain areas. You know, predatory pricing is probably the area that you know, most readily comes to mind. 
But frankly, the economics underlying the Brookgroup case, you know, already at the time of that case were quite questionable. And there's been a lot of really good work about above cost predation. I'm thinking about the work of Aaron Edlin and others, you know, that I think suggests that the Brook Group decision could use some refinement. But if you look at how the doctrine works, it evolves through a common law process that gets pushed by people bringing cases. And if people aren't bringing cases or, or you know, bringing cases only to have them quickly settled, um, you know, where it's basically a battle between, you know, plaintiffs who know they've got a tough case, but defendants who know they don't want to absorb the litigation costs, you're not going to get a lot of doctrinal evolution in the courts, and you're therefore not going to get a lot of chance for, um, for uh, economists to come in and push the doctrine. So in some sense, there's a market failure in doctrinal evolution. The worse the doctrinal precedent is, the less likely it is that plaintiffs will bring ca cases and the less likely th that there is, quote unquote, market pressure on the doctrine to change. And I think we've seen that. So I think what economists can do is usefully bring to bear their knowledge to make arguments, make papers, you write papers, give the agencies theories that they will try to advance. Those theories may fail at first, but ultimately they, they may get traction through you know, use of the guidelines through embedding in what the agency economists are doing. So when I look at what the FTC today is doing, I have to confess, I don't really know what the FTC today is doing, but I think, you know, there, there's a lot of criticism of the current agency, but I think one of the things that they're trying to do at root is to say, what are some of the net neglected areas of analysis, of thinking, some of the things Diana pointed to, let's focus on those. So the effects of a merger on, you know, upstream on labor bargaining. Not something that's gotten a lot of attention. Reduced headcount has always been an efficiency in mergers. You know, very clinically, that's, what we talk, that's how we talk about job loss. But I think the agency now is saying, well, now there's a question about monopsony power or buying power in the labor market that we wanted to take into account. Now look, that raises policy questions. If you ever came up with a conflict between less bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis workers and less ability to gain cost savings that would be passed through to consumers. That would be an interesting kind of policy balance for the agency, uh, I think, to try to make. But putting that aside, I think it's important for economists to play that role of looking more carefully at these intermediate and upstream effects. And I think that economists can do that successfully. And I'll just give one example. You know, for a long time, unilateral effects were just not a winning theory in court. Um, unless you could show absolutely massive market shares, you are not going to get a court to say that in a merger, what we're concerned about is the merging party's ability to ignore their remaining rivals in the marketplace. Look back at Judge Posner and Hospital Corp. Look at a whole lot of cases. There's all this language saying that you know, what we care about in mergers are coordinated effects. And Along came a bunch of people saying, well, actually, we have any kind of product differentiation with relatively modest market shares, you could actually have unilateral effects. Think about the work of Carl Shapiro and others, Joe Joe Farrell on upward pricing pressure, Steve Salop. You know, it's a lot of very good work that's been done on that. We put that in the 2010 guidelines when, when I was at the FTC, spelled out how you would do unilateral effects analysis. It had been in the 92 guidelines, but with a lot less rigor and explanation. And look what happened. The FTC started to, the agency started, not the FTC and the DOJ, both agencies started to bring unilateral effects into their theories of harm. Along comes the H&R Block case, and Judge Howell absolutely rejects Oracle against PeopleSoft, the precedent that stood against unilateral effects. And now we've got an adoption of a more advanced way of thinking economically about unilateral effects. It took, you know, roughly, I can't remember how long it was, but you know, a decade, a number of years between Oracle PeopleSoft and um, uh, you know, and 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 H and R Block, but the economists did the work of laying the track that the doctrine would eventually follow. So I think that that's a really valuable piece of work for economists to do, even if for a while it's not having immediate impact. All right, thank you, Howard. Um, so I think you you did a good job of laying out ways that economists kind of influence the direction. I know one of my colleagues here at the University of Florida, Roger Blair, had tremendous effects 
in laying out what really is a vertical relationship. And that's, you know, sometimes we fall into jargon, but by vertical, we mean that, you know, somebody is supplying a product that someone else uses in producing yet another product. That's that vertical relationship. And, and Roger did some tremendous work that's been cited by the Supreme Court. You know, some of the people you cited as well really have led the ways in how people think about things. Um, but Ben, I'm going to give you a really difficult job here. It, it's very easy for us when we're, we're specialized in economics or you're specialized in law. We, we talk in terms of things like, well, you know, the, the common law, the case law takes us this direction. And, and then we have the unilateral effects and we have the you know, marginal cost being affected. And, and you know, a lot of people just get lost in it pretty quickly. Um, can you kind of help us understand what's what's being done here, what we're talking about here, and why it actually matters to people who aren't deeply into the profession. Uh, thanks, Mark, and thanks for everyone uh, on the panel. I appreciate all the discussion. And it's a great question, and I, I always love this, is why should I care? Why is it important what economists do? And so I'll, I'll say a, a few examples and a few questions. First of all, we've heard a little bit of discussion about prices already. And we all know that we care about prices. And even in today's world, we're hearing about inflation and, and different supply chain problems. And we're wondering, you know, what are the sources of that, uh, these increased prices? Those are large questions, but, but the point is we notice, <laughs> we care. It affects our, our constraints as a family, as an individual, what we can purchase. And that comes to the fundamentals of economics. Economics is the study of uh, choices under constraint in, in a world of scarcity. And everything is scarce and choices are, are made. So how are those choices best made and what can economists do at a at a large level when we're talking about antitrust and the way that companies uh, might merge and therefore uh, control resources and allocate resources and what, what ultimate effect that might have on our day-to-day -day constraints as well. So that is the basis of the study that we're looking at. So we've talked about the consumer welfare standard and, and briefly stated, and, and I do agree that it is very uh, malleable and can be uh, grown uh, to include a lot of different concerns, but let's look at it from this, what it literally says, the consumer welfare, and let's define the consumer as that end user. So uh, me, the individual, the American uh, consumer walking about their day, purchasing goods and services, what antitrust and economists would do. Well, one thing we're concerned in mergers, as David said, about whether it's gonna raise prices. So that's one thing that we might be concerned about. Another thing, however, as we look at how services uh, are distributed, is that useful uh, for the consumer? And that's a con concern. Uh, we've seen that, we saw that in Staples, uh, a very famous case for economists where we looked at a lot of price data but we also were able to look at how the distribution of, of my uh, post-its uh, might be impacted in a merger. And uh, we defined a, a market to include the distribution system of a big store such as Staples, uh, that that was important to consumers. That was reflected in the data and it was brought to, to the forefront uh, by economists. So, that's something we, have, we take into consideration, which is arguably a non-price uh, uh, element. Let's put it into another context, another example of that kind of, of shopping. Um, I am a working woman with, with children and I don't have a lot of time to go shopping. Uh, so I like to go one place and that's it, rather than go to five different stores. Here in Southern California, I shop at a supermarket called Vons. And, and so Vons has all kinds of different things. But there was a time when uh, Vons wanted to merge with another uh, supermarket in Southern California. And antitrust back in that day uh, took a very strong look at, at mergers like that and whether or not it would increase concentration and, and be detrimental. 
Uh, arguably, it uh, took a lot of the court looked a lot at the impact of that merger on so-called competitors, some of them much smaller, and they didn't allow the merger to happen. And the question is, yes, that, that protected, arguably it protected competitors, but did that do the American consumer good? Did that help me? Or did it force me to spend my time, which I use with family and friends and at work, did it force me to use my time instead to drive to different places, use my very expensive Southern California gasoline uh, to go to these different places for the benefit of supporting competitors who I don't really want to go to. So that's taking the focus arguably off consumer demand and where consumer demand is going, uh, where arguably economists would be able to identify that this is actually a response, the merger is a response to consumer demand. It is not an attempt to try and get rid of the competition in order to raise prices, but really to grow larger in order to accommodate the growing demand that had moved at that time from going to the butcher, the baker, the candles to maker, and just going to one stop. So that, that arguably economists could have recorrected and, and identified that, no, this is part of the consumer demand that we should encourage this as a good allocation of, of the, the goods. And arguably not all competitors uh, should stay in the marketplace if there is no need for them to do so. Let's switch that too to considerations of, of innovation. Uh, uh, this is a harder one, I think, for consumers sometimes to see in that it's very difficult to prove the negative. What if we hadn't allowed the merger uh, uh, or what if we had allowed the merger? What might have occurred uh, if we stop a merger? And so innovation is very much a part of concern of uh, economists. It's harder to test sometimes. It's difficult to model sometimes. So we look at the incentive structures that any uh, activity might create or uh, any contract uh, that exists, whether it's an exclusive deal or something else uh, might facilitate uh, or a joint venture and how that might work. So we're concerned about innovation as well as some of the uh, issues that might arise in that as well. So we would consider that uh, definitely in the FCC, uh, there's a lot of data that is thinking about quality issues increase of quality issues. We look at everything from cell tower positioning to different characteristics of, of calls and of internet connections, such as jitter and latency and other characteristics. We use that as part of our analysis and think forward uh, in the case of a merger, would a merger facilitate that as we clearly are watching demand and have accounted for demand looking, for example, for uh, high quality streaming, which we all hope this is on a high quality streaming uh, broadband connection. Uh, so those uh, types of elements are very, very important. Uh, we have economists not only at the DOJ looking at those types of issues, uh, but also at the FCC looking at those innovation issues. The move to 5G in the mobile world has had profound uh, effects in economists' consideration of what incentive structures are necessary uh, to really encourage this, uh, what seems to be a significant architectural change. Economists don't know for sure, but seems to be. So we take that into consideration as well, and it can affect uh, consumers' daily life. Consumers broadly defined, uh, not just me as sort of an individual, but a workplace, as, as we all know, the internet connection, for example, to continue in that example, has an impact as all our workplaces. Uh, so the consumer, in my case, might be my university as we teach online classes. The consumer could be a small business where this is an input for them. So innovation uh, is very much part of our calculus. Uh, when we look, for example, at a very large uh, um, a company that is involved in breaking down the DNA genome uh, with maybe a potential merger with another company. 
uh, that could result in a joint research that could help cure cancer. What's antitrust to do? Or are we supposed to just look at the market, uh, a sort of a narrow definition of the market and think only about that or about the potential innovation and, and quite frankly, let them roll the dice or don't let them roll the dice because the prices might be such a concern. Um, I do think we also, and this is an, a very important uh, refocusing, if you will, or a, a, a resurrection of interest in economists in, is in the labor markets and the impact and evaluation of labor markets whenever we look at whether it's a merger or uh, some kind of constrictive contract clause. Uh, I revel in this uh, uh, new launch of interest in, in the labor markets. It's an important part of antitrust and has existed for some time. Um, so that can affect how you work. Uh, in California, for example, we do not look at, we do not uh, have a strong enforcement of non-compete clauses. If you work and you have a non-compete clause in your uh, um, uh, labor agreement, basically what that means is if you leave, then you usually can't uh, work for a competitor of your prior employer, or you can't set up your own business that would compete. We don't enforce that in the state of California as a matter of uh, state law, but there are other places that do. Think about that under certain circumstances, an economist would be very skeptical of the need for that because why limit labor? Uh, and they should be very skeptical of that. I think that's a wonderful progression. I also think that we have just seen a, an exciting labor case in uh, uh, um, uh, the recent case of Alston, uh, the uh, NCAA. And if you are up to date with your NCAA student athlete labor market, you'll know that there was a win, if you will, for uh, NCAA student athletes of particular markets. Uh, that was the FBS and also division one men and women's basketball. Uh, so why suddenly do we have this win for student athletes against restraints imposed upon them by the NCAA such that uh, there was a recognition that they are providing labor and that their uh, restraints should not limit uh, the types of compensation in some narrow regards uh, to those student athletes. Why do we have that case? 100% because of an economist. Roger Knoll uh, at Stanford uh, well defined the labor market of those student athletes using very basic principles of economics, looking to make sure that we know that that indeed is a viable antitrust uh, cognizable market and took that from the, from the case where it was defined all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, an economist did that and it was one, one on the basis of well-defined economics metrics. So, uh, why it matters is we take a lot of considerations in there. I agree with speakers who have said before, it can be broader and we should not be afraid of that. Um, and I, I love uh, David's comments about how already we have some uh, metrics, yes, like in the guidelines as, as, as Howard said as well, but we can bring in our economic analysis and we can bring in our new understandings of these markets. We can lay the tracks and move forward and, and it's very um, uh, effective for that. But I don't think we should lose sight of what we do well is, is really putting our, our uh, feet in the place of, of consumers because once we start worrying uh, a, a bit and that can be broadly defined, but uh, that's what we do well. Regulators do other things well. Uh, so for example, certain things I don't think antitrust can deal as well as, as potentially with a regulator, but there are many things that we do well. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. I, I really appreciate everything you brought to bear because it does, antitrust does affect you know, our everyday shopping experiences, affects our work lives and, and affects, you know, we're all, not all, but a lot of us are very passionate about college athletics. It affects that too. And I'm glad you brought that out. One interesting point, at least interesting to me, 
If you go back to the some of the origins of antitrust in the United States, one of the people that drove it was a gentleman named Louis Brandeis. He became a Supreme Court justice, but he worked with Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt to, to get antitrust kind of on their radar screens and, and um, you know, go after some good trust busting. One of the things that he thought as I read his writings to try and understand how his mind worked is, is he was in favor of really small firms, but not competition necessarily. He really didn't think these small firms should compete because he didn't want you to have to spend time doing comparison pricing. He really thought the government should allow little companies, encourage little companies to collude so those shoppers didn't have to waste their time trying to figure out what they were going to buy. Uh, that thought that was a really interesting idea. His, his perspectives on small firms came from how he thought about the human efficiency and such. It didn't come from how we think about competition today. So I won't go any farther, but you brought some really, really good, interesting points. Um, so I'm going to jump around a little bit on, on some of the questions that I had thought I would ask, because you've all been adding so much really good content to, uh, to our discussion here. Let me jump down um, to, Diana, something that you talked about earlier, yeah, things that economists could improve in what we do to support good antitrust actions, good antitrust laws, good court rulings. Um, could you expand on that a little bit? And after you've expanded, David, I'll turn to you to get your perspective on that, please. Sure, uh, thanks for that question, Mark. So um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I've already said, and I think there's probably agreement uh, that economists have, have played a very valuable role, but they have focused too much on price, but they've done that because price data and price analysis was really a go-to uh, tool for economists. Um, I do think the, the debate over uh, too much focus on price, not enough focus on non-price dimensions of competition has been caught up in two unfortunate um, maelstroms. One is the, the bigger debate over whether it's the total welfare standard or the consumer welfare standard. And that's not a question for this panel. Um, a second uh, debate is, is really a, um, what, has, what, it, what has evolved to be a pretty fundamental misunderstanding by non-economists, non-antitrust experts um, about what the consumer welfare standard is, what it does, what it's capable of. And so there have been proposals to throw out the consumer welfare standard um, and replace it with something, um, something uh, far more rigid, for example, bright line tests um, uh, and even targeted legislation that goes to specific companies that are of a certain size, uh, cite you know, some of the big tech bills. All right, so those are two um, side debates which have really complicated and muddied uh, the debate over the role of economists. Okay, and I've already said that the consumer welfare standard is really capable of much more. It's it the, it's broad. It's deep. Um, it can look at short term static price effects, uh, but can also look at more dynamic effects on the competitive effects side of the ledger, uh, such as quality and innovation. The problem is economists have been a little a little reluctant to go there. We haven't seen that many standalone cases on non-price dimensions of competition where that's the theory of harm. Uh, Tokyo Electron, for example, is, a, is, is one good example of a, a, almost a standalone case on an innovation theory. Um, you know, the, the cases against Facebook and, and even Google, I think if you boil them down are really about quality effects because we're talking about zero price markets. But the bottom line is, um, the go-to has been short-term price effects on the competitive effects side of the ledger. Um, the problem I think is because the non-price effects have not really been explored as much as they should be. And, and it makes sense that as markets evolve, technology evolves, you know, we are seeing the exchange of goods and services uh, under different metrics of exchange. It doesn't have to be a dollar sign. It can be attention, it can be time, it can be information that, that that users provide. And this is the rise of the digital economy. But you've got to also look at the efficiency side of the ledger. And what we see mostly, and especially horizontal merger cases and in vert vertical merger cases, is a real focus on, um, yes, we see short-term marginal cost reductions, but we see a lot of arguments coming from defendants uh, that, oh, my vertical merger will produce lots and lots of of uh, more dynamic efficiencies, right? Economies of coordination, um, lots of innovation, better products, faster to market. These are more ethereal, less 
Uh, these are in a different bucket. These are in the long-term dynamic efficiencies bucket where we're really seeing the demand curve pushed out as opposed to the short-term efficiencies bucket where we're seeing the marginal cost curve pushed down. So we have a fundamental imbalance. A lot of cases are, are, are lost by plaintiffs, i.e. the government, on the basis of not proving harmful short-term price effects, but they are won on the efficiency side by arguments that, oh, these longer-term dynamic efficiencies are gonna win the day and will absolutely overpower uh, adverse competitive effects. That is a fundamental imbalance that anybody in the antitrust community should care about. We're, we're, we're putting the courts in a very difficult position. We're putting enforcers in a very difficult position. And we get outcomes like AT&T Time Warner, for example, where um, that case pretty much turned on a longer term efficiencies argument. And if you go back and look at the data, which, which we did in writing a review of, of of the uh, case just recently when they've decided to spin off Warner Media to merge with Discovery, three, not three years later after litigating that case, absolutely they probably realized the short-term cost benefits, absolutely, but absolutely did not realize the long-term uh, innovation and dynamic efficiencies that the case really turned on. So the question for us really is, um, is this consumer welfare standard role of economics, consideration of price and non-price effects, both uh, on the anti-competitive effects side, but also the debate going on on the efficiency side, short-term versus longer-term efficiencies. Is it so bollocked up now that we need to hit the reset button and come up with a new standard? Um, and, and my answer to that is no. Uh, what we do need to do is to provide more guidance, more support, from legislation, for example, that strengthens and clarifies and modernizes the law. And I think we need the agencies to think hard about how to issue, uh, how to issue new guidance, for example. Uh, pulling back the vertical merger guidelines and uh, pushing them back out with less, uh, less emphasis on, on, uh, on efficiencies uh, and, and a more balanced view of anti-competitive effects and efficiencies would be a good, a good thing. I think, um, uh, one possibility for an FTC rulemaking is, is about direct evidence. What constitutes direct evidence in merger cases, monopolization cases? So that would be you know, one possible way to use agency guidance. Um, so I will leave it at that. I think there's a lot that economists can still do, and, but they need some sort of impetus or support for doing that by um, an acknowledgement by the enforcement agencies supported by a uh, supported by coherent legislation, broad base that supports uh, antitrust enforcement. All right, thank you, Diana. David, what would you add to that? What would you change? Uh, well, I'm gonna be uh, uh, somewhat more micro than, uh, than Diana was, uh, less big picture. But actually uh, for the audience, we had a rehearsal on Monday and Diana at that point said something that I thought was interesting and I followed up. She said, there's all sorts of evidence that markups have increased and concentration has increased, big picture, and innovation seems less than it was, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, maybe I'm probably too blinkered as an antitrust guy, so I had to actually think about that. And I did deep research, which means I walked down the hall and knocked on the door of one of our macroeconomics professors. And it's true, there are stylized facts. Market concentration has increased, markups have increased, profits as a share of GDP has increased, labor share has declined, uh, labor productivity gap between frontier and laggard firms has gone up. A lot, a lot of bad things have happened. One question, obviously there's a lot to explain there. One question I have is, is antitrust the solution to that? I mean, I have a, one of the a representative paper here that came out in the uh, AEP journal. And their story is that diffusion of in innovative knowledge from leading firms to lagging firms has slowed down a lot. And using that assumption, they find they can explain all of these stylized facts. Well, if that's really the story, then uh, uh, IP law clearly plays, plays a role there, not necessarily straight line antitrust, but IP law for sure. On the, end, on the other hand, have they really got that right? Because the way macro types work these days is they don't base something like what I just told you about based on IO models of how, how firms compete. They have growth models. <laughs> and they sort of assume tech, uh, diffusion differences of knowledge from one firm to the other. And if you tweak that sort of model enough, you can account for a lot of these stylized facts in the same way. 
So it's interesting, but it isn't like they're saying necessarily that concentration has gone up and profits have gone up because there have been too many mergers or because anti-competitive conduct broadly defined has happened. That could be true, but you can't get that out of these papers. So I think economists should look at this stuff, learn more about it than I think most, IO, most antitrust economists do, and start to think about, could these style, are these stylized facts really correctly described by knowledge spillovers, which is the story mainly because that one thing accounts for most of these stylized facts at the same time. That doesn't mean it's the reason though. Uh, so there, I would say that this literature is very provocative and IO economists and in particular antitrust economists should look at it. Uh, one thing that would help a great deal is to be able to get, res somebody said we have lots of resources and in my experience at the antitrust division, we did. I mean, you know, we were not resource constrained there. Uh, what we need is legal resources here, I think. The antitrust division would love to have the legal authority the FTC does to go back and look at mergers which have taken place in a serious sort of way that might involve subpoenas and getting data, and some of the things you might actually do if you were really going to litigate, which you know, maybe we won't do and probably shouldn't, but to really find out what, what mergers do require serious study beyond just you know, reading the newspapers or something like that. Uh, I think we'd learn a lot. Now, in my earlier uh, answer to one of, one of uh, uh, Mark's questions. I said there is this well-developed body of merger analysis tools. That's true. It is well-developed by many standards. What is not well-developed about, though, is confronting it with data because we don't get the chance to do that much. Uh, you know, we predict bad things will happen or good things will happen. Uh, maybe they will, maybe they won't. I mean, at the DOJ, uh, once the case has gone away for whatever reason, we're done. Uh, and we have a lot to do, so we, we don't go back and look and see what happened. Now, at the FTC, they have the legal authority to do that, but it took a gentleman, I think we all can see that Tim Uris is a power, is a force of nature, and it, it took a Tim Uris to do that. I don't recall that happening uh, before. So as long as people are talking about new legislation, it would be great to have legal authority, I think, for the two federal agencies to do serious studies, kind of like the, the IRS sometimes audits you when you haven't done anything wrong. This is called a compliance audit. It's a tough audit, but they do it only to, re to populate their databases. You, you, may, you may not end up with anything bad happening to you. I wouldn't go that far because it is a very tough audit. But if we uh, had the ability to at least drill down to some extent on mergers, which to us seem to test theories uh, which we might use in litigation someday, whether we litigated those mergers or not, I think we'd learn a lot. And uh, we don't know that sort of thing now. Now, I think economists should have a bit more training in technology than they do. You know, most of us who've worked on merger cases have had to cope with technology issues, but typically at the end, it boils down to marginal costs. So if you work in a wireless merger, you're gonna think about assumptions about uh, how fast 4G overtakes 5G or, Maybe if you're being broad-minded, how fast 5G penetrates to rural areas, something like that. The Patent and Trademark Office used to have at least a program with Johns Hopkins where would-be patent examiners would go to school for a year and get sort of a master's degree in technology broadly defined. Might not be a bad idea for economists to do that. Uh, you know, that said, a deep knowledge of technology only gets you so far. Uh, there's been a lot written about uh, the FTC taking a pass on challenging uh, Amazon about search directed ads back in the 2011, 2012 region. And in hindsight, it looks like they got it wrong. I think Daily Beast had a story in which apparently there are leaked memos from the F FTC and you got to see the economist memo and the lawyer's memo. The fact was it was kind of a tough call for anybody. There were definitely very promising competitors to Amazon at that point. <laughs> There are other people that uh, were either were about to offer search-based ads or were offering them with big names and lots of funding. How can you say from the standpoint of 2011 that those are gonna turn out never to matter? It wasn't just economists who get guessed wrong on that. It was everybody, including the firms who turned out not to matter. If they didn't think they were gonna be significant, they wouldn't have tried to enter in the first place. So in some sense, you know, saying economists blow the technology enhanced can't understand big tech is really saying to the extent that a public policy issue depends on knowing a lot 
about what's going to happen to technology, it's going to be very hard to get right. <laughs> Whoever's trying to do it. There are not people with skill sets which reliably let, let them do, do that. If there were, Microsoft would be a big deal in, and, in wireless phones. It's not. Uh, if it were, Nokia would be a big deal in wireless phones. It isn't. They tried, they flopped. Uh, but I still think economists should try to think of technology more broadly as something which we're going to fit into marginal cost at the end of the day. Finally, uh, vertical mergers. It's a hobby horse of mine, right? I should admit I, I, I work in this area. Uh, and I also was one of the people alluded to in, uh, I think, uh, something Howard said, uh, at, at the DOJ, uh, when we were thinking about what to do with the merger, if it seemed to solve a double, double markup problem, we were good with it. If it seemed to fit the one monopoly rent, box checked, let's think about something else. Now, there are, looking at the effects of vertical mergers is tough because they're very, it's very hard to find empirical data, right? And unless you've got a lip, unless somebody's suing something, it's almost impossible to get relevant data from firms. Uh, Economic theory of vertical mergers is really, really complicated, uh, as, as I know, because I've lectured on it. Uh, you know, one of the nicest papers is the one by Yong Min Chen. And it took me four or five days of work to understand the paper in the first place. And every time I lectured on it, I have to spend two or three more, more hours making sure I understood all the lemmas and propositions. Well, there's a more rough and ready approach, which people have begun to take and, you know, Full disclosure, I'm one of them, uh, which says maybe the next best thing is to do what are called Monte Carlo simulations, or in general, just do a lot of complicated simulations and see what the answers are. Uh, there's a very nice paper by Mike Salinger, which does this. And there's also a paper up in SSRN uh, by a guy named Gleb Domenenko and myself. And here's what seems to happen. When people told you that solving the, so imagine a single upstream monopoly and two downstream firms, and they need to have the monopolist input in order to operate. It's true, a vertical merger between the monopolist and one of the downstream firms, it does solve a markup, double markup problem, and it does work, no question about it. The downstream price of the merged firm goes down, but other things happen too. It is still quite possible that the merged firm is going to foreclose the remaining firm, in many of the simulations, the reigning firm has to pay more for the input afterwards. But even when that's not the case, the remaining firm still loses because the combination of having to compete with a price that reflects solving a double markup problem, when you're not solving a double markup problem yourself because you're not vertically integrated, that tends to mean that the remaining downstream firm loses money and potentially could go out of business. So this is hardly the end of the story, but Salinger has results like that. We have results like that. And I think economists should look more at that. Uh, uh, I probably talked more than my allotted time already on that. So I'll, I'll wait to maybe pounce later on. All right, well, thank you, David. Appreciate it greatly. Um, we have, uh, we're past our time to take questions from the audience. Uh, so I need to turn to that very quickly here. And uh, they, the first question has to do with political censorship and big tech. And it's not directed to any particular panelist. So whoever would like to answer, please do so. Let me read the question. There are actually two parts to it. First, can antitrust analysis contribute to limiting the political censorship of big tech? And are there economic factors that contribute to the censorship that should be analyzed in the processes that we're all discussing here. So censorship, big tech, is this, this, this an antitrust and how in the world will we analyze it, whether it is or is not. Uh, does anyone want to take a, a stab at that? Wow, well, so I'll, not, not I'll try. <laughs> so Scott, let me turn to you on that because you, you actually teed that up at the, your, your opening thoughts. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, first, I, I, you know, you're talking about the pol uh, political motive, this goes to political motivations of why different groups are different, you know, certain groups are interested in pursuing the companies. Um, and so I guess the first question is whether there's evidence that this is actually a systematic, a, a real systematic issue, or if it's something that's just played up way more for political reasons than for anything else. Um, and then the second is, uh, I, you know, inherently don't think that's an, it's an antitrust issue. I think it goes more, it's probably more about a section 230 issue and ultimately a first amendment issue. 
Um, and I think the First Amendment should be considered more or less sacrosanct. Um, and it's not something that antitrust should be involved in. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Um, Mark, I would just, I would chime in. Um, you generally agreeing with Scott, agreeing with what Scott just said. I, I, you know, I think the backstory on the legislation, the, the legislation that targets uh, not just the digital tech sector, but just com large companies within the sector. Um, the reason why there's bipartisan support for the bills in the House and the Senate is because there were grave concerns about free speech issues during the 2020 election. That is a very tenuous uh, thread that holds uh, both sides of the aisle together on, on supporting antitrust legislation, but I, I, uh, that, that doesn't address the sector as a whole, but specific companies in a sector. Um, I, I also think this is more of a 230 issue. And, um, the, part of the problem is antitrust is being held up by, by you know, some voices uh, as the be all and the end all, the fix all for all problems, big tech. And you, you know, we've done some really good research at AI, legal and economic research, looking at big major problems raised by big tech and figuring out exactly what antitrust uh, is good for and what it is really not good for. And I think it really illustrates that big tech does pose a, a fundamental public policy problem. I mean, public policy problems are big problems and you need very much a toolkit approach. So antitrust should absolutely play a role, but there are other tools as well. There's, um, there's sector regulation, uh, for example, these digital business ecosystems are really rife with market failures and unique economic phenomenon that may require the oversight more of a dedicated sector regulator as opposed to using antitrust, but there's also um, there, there are also standards, standard setting involved. There is privacy policy. We don't have a privacy law in this country yet, and we need one. So loading up antitrust with things that it's really not designed to do, I think ultimately weakens antitrust. And that's not a good thing for advocates like myself and my organization that want to see stronger and more vigorous enforcement. Yeah, and Mark, maybe if, if I could just jump in, follow up on something Diana said that I think is important. You know, for, just first a disclosure, I have provided legal advice to Facebook, but not on this issue. And I don't currently, I'm not their, currently their litigation counsel or anything like that. Um, the, the point I wanted to make about, you know, builds on Diana's point about it being, you know, democracy and speech and the role of big tech in creating a forum for speech and the effects that can have on society I think that is a question that is largely outside of antitrust. Um, there may be ways that antitrust can affect it, but I think that some of those ways might be counterintuitive. I think if you have one big forum that is a biased gatekeeper, um, you know, First Amendment law treats them as something of an editor. And if it is a, if it is a private entity, they can sort of gatekeep as they wish. So you might say, well, if we're not going to tinker with the First Amendment or have some kind of open access or common carriage requirement uh, when it comes to speech, then what can we do through antitrust? Well, the, the answers are primarily structural. Um, I would say, you know, you could have certain kinds of essential facilities or interconnection arguments. But again, one needs to handle those very carefully when it comes to speech over private assets as opposed to public airwaves. So you could say, well, break up the companies, but I think the uh, the effects of that breakup could be very different. Could, could could be somewhat counterintuitive. You might not get more speech. You might get more fragmented, um, uh, you know, specialized and you know, in some sense, privatized speech. So you'll have multiple different social media sites catering to specific viewpoints never really crossing bridges. And so the biggest social media site might be one that, that has sort of a popular view. It's not discriminating against anybody else. It's just all the people who want to have those other viewpoints are off on their own specialized, fragmented social media sites talking to each other, but not across to people with different viewpoints. And so one of the, you know, if what you're looking for is a better uh, sort of more neutral open forum for speech, I'm not sure the structural kinds of things that antitrust ultimately gets at um, will be helpful there at the end of the day. You know, if you're concerned about something different, 
which is competition to attract people by putting in front of them junk food content that might get clicks and hits and attract eyeballs and attention for a while, but is you know in some ways bad for people. Um, again, uh, I think one needs to be careful about using structural solutions for that. There's an interesting op-ed in the San Jose Mercury News a few months ago by Aaron Edlin and Carl Shapiro. And they said, well, what might actually happen is you get a lot of different social media sites competing by giving you ever more toxic but addictive forms of junk food. And you may actually get a race to the bottom through those structural solutions. So um, I do think some of the problems that are most talked about involving social media are problems that society needs to grapple with. Let's be very clear about that. But it's, it's almost a cheap evasion to point at antitrust and say, oh, if we could only fix antitrust, none of these problems would exist and not grapple with how hard these problems really are and what other public policy tools we might bring to bear. All right, very good. Um, I still if, have a couple of if questions. If I could just jump in really quick as well, because I want to echo. At four minutes. Uh, so you get yeah, one. Uh, Okay, uh, I'll echo Diana Howard. I don't think it's any trust uh, problem per se. That said, usually what we talk about is that uh, it, more voices will help, more outlets will help. Uh, so one thing that was interesting uh, potentially to look at is the, the background to that, the technological inputs, uh, whether we have too highly concentrated a market in the cloud, for example, that would support the platforms and whether the use of those was used uh, in a competitively uh, to support uh, incumbents uh, against uh, would be um, new entrants. That, that very narrow question might be an antitrust question, but otherwise we've gone through this before. It's not an antitrust issue. The FCC has done uh, a range of work on first amendment issues, I think largely unsuccessfully. Uh, so I think that it's an interesting thing to look at and consider, but not for, uh, necessarily in antitrust. Okay, very good. Thank you. So I've been given a few more minutes by our, our staff. So I'll go to one more audience question, and then I'll ask uh, Scott to, to wrap up. Um, and, and Bruce, we've, we've not heard from you for a while, so I'm going to give you this question. And if you don't like it, well, life's just tough. Um, you, you get it anyway. Um, so the question is, uh, what would it be a meaningful way for economists to try and quantify the value on the intangibles that give big tech their power? Well, assume they've got power. Why is that true? Um, they're thinking in terms of data collection. The uh, questioner is hard to quantify the value of consumer privacy. So maybe that really doesn't show up on our graphs and our charts. How do economists actually deal with this, this issue? The intangibles around what gives or the consequences of um, Big tech market power. Okay, um, so I guess I could cheat and just talk about what I want to talk about, but I, I think I'll I'll get to that question. Um, so so th there are ways in which we could try and get at sort of looking at you know what what your your question is you know what's causing big tech to have market power. Uh, I, I, there, there's something that Diana said in, in our, our planning uh, conference call and said, you know, the IO economists have dropped the ball, which, which probably is 90% is right. Um, and uh, all these labor economists and finance people have done um, these studies on, on sort of concentration and how things are getting worse. And the IO economists are, have been out. And I, I said, yeah, we're out because we, we understood that was stupid 40 years ago, you know, when, when, when we rejected that same type of work in, in the 60s. But uh, I mean, just to be fair, uh, IO economists have actually looked at sort of some of the work that's been done on sort of, you know, whether there's increasing concentration, whether increasing markets. So I, I suggest people look at uh, Ben Card, Yerkulu and Zhang uh, 2021 paper, uh, which, you know, they said, look, if you look, go back a little bit, you know, um, uh, concentration, uh, it has been falling, you know, uh, you know, since the 90s. Um, there is a lot of, uh, Luke Frobe and Greg Worden have, have a good piece on, you know, a lot of these papers on, on concentration are, um, are, are, are based on NAICS uh, sector codes, not antitrust markets. And so you have to be a bit careful. And if you look at the local level, you know, uh, 
antitrust concentration has been falling. On margins, there's a, a nice paper by Dopper, uh, Miller, McKay, and Stivali. I mean, Nathan Miller is an IO economist, former DOJ guy, and they basically said, okay, markups have been going up, but why? And it turns out that most of it's because costs have fallen, right? And if you sort of say, well, you know, yeah, markups are made up of a price and a cost, and it's in fact, the markets are getting big because costs are falling, then uh, it sort of seems like that's not something you want to be stopping. The, the questions of big tech, and, and this is sort of, I, I guess it's, it's a, a, a constraint on antitrust, but you know, maybe a sensible one. And if a firm uh, is successful and grows large because they have better products, uh, lower costs, you know, and, and all that, then you know, that is traditionally not an issue or a problem or an antitrust violation, right? Uh, we don't actually penalize firms for, for being big uh, as of now. Uh, whether or not um, they did stuff which harmed competition, which excluded rivals and the like. I mean, that's standard um, antitrust. And, and, you know, I think that's the way in which you can go forward. Measuring sort of, you know, the importance of privacy and, and, and big data. I mean, people are working on that. Um, I, I uh, recommend, you know, uh, Catherine Tucker's work, James Cooper uh, at Scalia Law has done a lot of uh, great work on that issue, has, has a privacy uh, center. And uh, so, so we are looking at that. And, and to say that, you know, I, I think the problem that I see with, you know, the current administration is that they're not going to wait or, or pay attention to sort of evidence. They're just going to do something based on, you know, what I see is, you know, non-causal evidence. And, and they have not identified the effect of antitrust on any of these things. And uh, maybe somebody will but I don't think you should put the cart before the horse and sort of change antitrust regulation based on, you know, a lot of flawed work. All right. Thank you, Bruce. So um, I'm now out of time. Uh, so Scott, my apologies. I'm not going to allow you to, to sum up. Um, so let me just say a, a great thank you to, uh, to our panel here and to our audience. Uh, as I've listened to you, economics has been very useful for dealing with some truisms, some conjectures that people had that turned out once you analyze them carefully, aren't true. Going back and looking at practices that we've conducted and finding out, hey, they didn't really play out the way we thought they would. And so we've needed to improve that. And then there's all kinds of challenges for the future as well. Um, that's uh, the dynamic markets, innovation, et cetera. We've not quite gotten our heads around those on a lot of other issues. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I hope that um, our audience has, has benefited from it and listened to it and, and that we're able to get some good, um, some more effective policies as a result of this discussion. So again, thank you all very much and thank you to the audience as well.